this to order, a uh, meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, the next thing on our agenda is to approve the agenda. <laughs> Does anyone have anything they'd like to change? Okay. So we can deem that approved. Uh, next is comments from me. Uh, I don't have anything. Um, we have uh, a couple things tonight. Um, we're going to have hopefully a new commissioner by the time we meet next time. Um, this, that's going to be on the agenda of the city council meeting this week. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, so moving on. Uh, do we have any comments from the public about something that's not on the agenda tonight? Is anyone here to make a comment? Okay. Um, so for the next item, we're trying something new. This was Aaron's suggestion this week, was to bump up the approval of the minutes to earlier in the night. <coughs> See if we, it's, it's an administrative <laughs> footnote, right, and, and go through. So ask everyone to take a look at the minutes, if you haven't already. I looked at them earlier, they seem fine to me. Um, so we don't approve July 15th then, since it was not a quorum? Yeah, I don't think it needs to be. Okay. So that Is that right, Mike? Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Um, we, I'll, I fair. put it out there in case somebody has, if somebody wanted to make an, a change, they could, but it doesn't have to be voted on. to approve, but I wasn't at one of them, so I won't. <laughs> well, that's all the I'll move to approve June 24th and July 29th. Okay. Second. Okay. In favor of approving the agenda for those two dates? Or the minutes for those two dates? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay. Second by, um, see, and it's done. It is done. All right, right. It's here we go. Away that way. It's so now you can get out faster. It's right. I think we part of the part of the genius of it might be that we're not in our like over analytical mode yet. By the end of the meeting, we would yeah, be. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> it makes us switch gears at the end of the makes night. Makes us read them in advance yeah. too. Yeah. So. All right. So the next thing on the agenda is to hear a proposal from Kate Stevenson uh, from. Uh, the College of Fine Arts uh, about a parcel on Berry Street. Okay, yeah. yes, please, please come up. Did you bring any copies? I brought one copy, but I didn't bring ones okay. for everyone. All right, uh, do you want me to sorry. run down and throw them on a photocopier? Will that be a, a helpful thing to do? Won't take me any time to do yeah. it. Sure. No, this is the not. best? Yeah. Okay. Good to hey, Mike, there was also you know. this. I don't know if this is going to be more accurate because it's got the setbacks and everything. Yeah, I didn't this print that one because it... This is part of your... It was a PDF that was, attachment. Right, that I don't know if this is more accurate or not. Uh, but the issue that we're oh, talking about at this point is just okay, the boundary line. All right, just, perfect. So, yeah, okay, I felt like that one was a little easier to read than, gotcha. than that version, but yeah. Okay. So, okay, we don't. Should I dive in or wait for you can, Mike? You, it's fine. I, I think you can, yeah, exactly. You can catch us up to where Mike is okay. because we, and assume that we don't know anything about what you're asking about. So. Great. So, um, my name's Kate Stevenson. I'm on the team that is um, working on a design for a 18 acre parcel currently owned by BCFA um, adjacent to Sabin's Pasture. So, um, the team that we're working on is kind of in the conceptual design phase for the site, but we're looking at two development phases, one for a bathhouse and then another for affordable housing and retail commercial space along Berry Street um, that would come later on. And the reason that we're here tonight is that um, in talking with the planning department staff, um, we were looking at the zoning sections of this parcel and it's, it's unusual in that there are three zoning um, districts you know, in that one parcel. Um, up at the top, it's kind of mixed-use residential. Um, the middle is residential 24,000, 
and the bottom is the riverfront district. Um, so we're not looking at doing any development in the top part. Um, it's going to be all in the riverfront district, but the place where we're interested in locating the bathhouse is kind of right on the boundary between residential 24,000. You'll see this when we get mm -hmm. the, the map um, and the riverfront. And when we looked at yep, um, the, this parcel and the Zorzi parcel, which is adjacent, you can see that that the dividing line kind of jogs between these two parcels. So yeah, it passes around. Um, and in in the conversation with staff, that we said, you know, is this fixed? Is there the possibility that we could move the line to the basically the dotted line so that it would be matching up with the Zorzi parcel? Um, and it would give us a little bit more flexibility in the site plan and the footprint for the proposed bathhouse. Um, and my understanding from talking with Mike is that there, um, this isn't necessarily a planning commission decision, but that we're supposed to go to city council with it. We're on the agenda for Wednesday, but we wanted to come and kind of make sure that you all were in the loop on what we were asking for and I believe that it would be kind of proposed as like one of the list of the zoning fixes that then go through the hearings in September. So. Yeah, thanks for coming to us. That's so this is river, This is all riverfront right now? Right. This line here? Okay. So the riverfront, you know, allows us to do pretty much anything that we want to do. <laughs> um, but obviously we wouldn't be able to have any commercial use in the current residential 24,000. Mm -hmm section. So what's the proposed use of the bathhouse? Why the bathhouse? Um, so it's going to be yeah, open to the public. It's going to include um, treatment rooms for things like, you know, massage and mm. different um, natural medicine, but like different pools, a saltwater pool, uh, sauna, kind of a, a variety of different uses, um, but with, with the focus to be um, kind of public health. Medicinal. Right. Medicinal. Right. It's not a spa. It's more of a, a bathhouse that's meant to serve the community on a regular basis. So how does that make it different than a spa? I'm just trying to understand. How I think that the, um, what we in the, the folks that are that are planning this are envisioning is it's not like a luxury one time a year you go to the spa, but it's more, mm. um, you know, you might go on a weekly or biweekly basis as part of like a health routine. But these are not regular swimming pool sizes. They are not swimming pools. They are there are two pools of different temperatures. Hydrotherapy. hydrotherapy. Yep. yep. And so this bathhouse, I can't really tell the proportions here, but it, it's not able to be located. Or what's the reason for having it at this spot? We um, walked the site, kind of have been doing a lot of site assessment and uh, and felt like that was the best spot to keep it um, both kind of behind the existing tree line as much as possible because we're trying to keep it kind of um, protected from the view shed. Um, and there are some some fairly steep slopes in there. And so we this is this is very much of a uh, it's not a final footprint that by any means. Like we're actually probably looking at some a couple smaller buildings that are adjacent to each other, different building envelopes. Um, but this is the general location. So um, yes, it could move in the process of the site design. Um, but we figured it's worth asking <laughs> if this change is possible. If they don't have the option, if the zoning line doesn't move. Right. right. What's the slope right there? Do we know? Where's um, the slope? I have a slope. Not that that this one necessarily dictates what zoning it's on. I'm just has some topo lines on it okay. that you can see. So it does start to get steep kind of further back in there. The idea is to align it with the, the topo as it exists. Yes and no. I think I, because of the slopes, we're imagining that some part of it, there may you know, two story um, on the lower part, but maybe one story on the upper part. I mean, again, that's part of the 
the site design that we haven't gotten into that level of detail yet. So it's somewhere in, in this tree line here. Yep. And just a quick question, is that a 20 or 30% slope? Do you, have you guys calculated where the siting is, what sort of drop-off there is? Again, we don't know, like, there there are 20 to 30% slopes in that area, but we, okay. the exact uh, footprints, this is just an initial concept. Okay. So what's the specific ask? The specific ask is, can we, to move the the divider line between those two zoning districts okay. up, and it's yep. about yep. 100 feet the on the right hand side and yep. maybe uh, yep. 70 feet on the okay. other side. And, there, and the context here was when a couple things. There aren't very many parcels where the zoning boundary actually goes through the parcel, so this is an exceptional case because of that. Uh, and there wasn't any, I don't think, planned reason for why the line is where it is. Is that? recollection Mike? Yeah, so the in 2017 when the City Council was going through to adopt these, um, the Planning Commission recommendation was to have the entire VCFA piece be residential 6,000 and the entire Savings Pasture piece to be residential 6,000. And won't get into all the details for why we made that recommendation, but we had our the Planning Commission had its recommendations for why they felt that would be the best way to accomplish the goals. The City Council wanted to be more prescriptive about saying this area should be high density and this area should be low density. And so they went through and started to make a couple of proposals and um, the first one that came across was uh, this, well I think initially there was one at like 300 or 350 and I think VCFA is at 450 right now, and that continued across into Sabins. Either at the next meeting or something else, the owner of Sabins came in and, and made some pitches for why uh, that was not good and things should be different. You know, he wanted the entire thing zoned one thing, and the planning in the city council came back and chose a different line. They wanted to match it to approximately what was approved by the Trust for Public Lands project. The Trust for Public Lands development on Sabins fits within that, well, you start to see the start of the box, but it goes across and then back down. So that was at like 550 feet, but they never went back and adjusted Sabins pasture, what, or uh, VCFA. What they wanted for VCFA was development down by the road, they wanted less development in the middle and then there's another zone up top which is more closely associated with the back of VCFA which they felt would be mixed use residential which is the same zoning district as VCFA so the thought was to break them into three three different sections and um, but there there isn't any magic to why that line was there other than it was a 450 feet was that how it was established the first time 450 feet from this from the edge of right away and that's where it is right that's now. where it is yeah because originally back in november that center section was going to be called to be mixed uh residential seventeen thousand. yeah right yours, but switched. in fact it ended up twenty four thousand. yeah because the it's the same zoning district as town hill so the town hill neighborhood went from 17 to 19 to 21 to 24 so it just it just kept that, 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 that just kept get, getting bigger to accommodate the the requests of the the neighborhood so when that changed rather than having two different rather than creating a whole new zoning district for this one piece we just matched the 17,000 on that map to the town hill 24,000 so what are the options if, let's say that this doesn't get changed, but, but the project continues? Are you looking at needing a variance or, or what to, to, for this to happen? Or is it just impossible? It wouldn't be possible because it's a, it would require a use variance, which isn't allowed under state law. So um, there wouldn't be any variance option for them to, to develop that use. They could develop housing in that area, um, 
but not but not the bathhouse. I have a question. Uh, Mike, if the if the line gets changed, does that does that change the density that's available on that uh, section closest to Barry Street? Yes. Yeah, whatever land was calculated before at the old density would be now calculated at the new density. I, are you asking? Are you asking the larger parcel, the riverfront parcel, if that density will be changed by this? No, I'm asking if just the, the small section closest to oh. Barry Street would be would would be available to have increased density as by virtue of the change in the zoning line. The the, the section that's marked yes. Phase Two on here. Correct. That's already riverfront. Correct. In other yeah. words, if, if the plan were to change at some point in the future, what would the zoning change, zoning line change due to the available density of that entire parcel? Because because the parcel gets larger. Yeah, because that that percentage of the parcel okay. gets larger. It always depends how things get how the project moves forward. Um, if phase two gets subdivided, then the answer would be no. There wouldn't be any additional um, develop that that density would be basically lost. It, but if it remains as a single parcel, then yes, because you have increased the amount of land in the higher density, you would be therefore increasing the amount of possible uh, development that could happen on the overall parcel. So this number of housing, it's 36, number of housing units, thirty six hundred yeah. square feet larger. Right. Yes. And then the the entire section is going to be within the. No, it was no. The thirty six hundred is the footprint of the building. That's the building. Okay. Do we know? Do we have any way to do some quick math to figure out how much it will affect the density? Uh, boy, that's that's funky math. <laughs> I know. Right. I know it's not a square. <laughs> it's not a square. I was <laughs> about to start to try to do it, and then say, and then I backed up and said, <laughs> "Would someone else see it?" Someone else here to try to. Try to perform that one it's because it's a good point, but I also yeah. like in the whole grand size of this parcel, it seems like yeah, I think this parcel not had a huge amount. Of extra. I think, yeah, I think the amount of development do, do you have on yours? Oh, do you have the rest of that? Which one report or just that one? This is the has the, the memo, first, your memo. Does the memo say how many units would be possible on the Riverfront portion of BCFA. It's your memo. I have like. <laughs> did, did you email that out? No. No. That this was this. This was what was sent was November first to City no, Council. Okay. Anything with a map, I just stick in the back. When so City Council had <laughs> questions on which which option they could choose, I gave them. You know, I was like, the Planning Commission Every recommended option. this. Here's option one. Here's option two. Here's option three. Here's option four. They chose one of them. If you guys want to keep talking, I'll, okay. I'll see if I can find can, the number. It's in here. It is in here. Can I just ask why why site the building where it is as opposed to turning it so that it's parallel to Berry Street, which would also make it somewhat parallel to uh, Topo Lines? Again, I would say this is not the footprint of the building. This is this is showing approximately the the area of what 3,600 square feet would look like, but this does not represent the exact location or alignment. So if the expansion is not to allow for the alignment of the building, then what is the expansion of the riverfront parcel for? To try and keep all of the building envelope kind of hidden behind the tree line. So it is generally in that location? Generally in that location, okay. but yeah, just because this is long and skinny, turn it this way doesn't necessarily mean. No, but if it was turned 90 degrees and aligned mm -hmm. with Berry Street, then it mm -hmm. would be within the existing parcel. So right. that's that's my question. Right. So it looks like it's it's uh, rotated so that it faces the ravine, perhaps, or. Something. Yeah, definitely trying to get the views, you know, oh, okay. towards Saban's pasture. Because that is the ravine that it's mm -hmm. hard to get against, right? Yes. Oh, is it?
Yeah, there's a drop off. You can see the little squiggly that kind of goes off to the off through Saban's pasture. This is a this is a stream, mm -hmm. so this is the low point. So as you're looking this way, it's dropping down to that stream. Um, in the answer to the question, at its existing shape, there are 87 units possible in there. Um, if it got bigger, there would be more potential. I have. I mean, welcome. I don't. I haven't heard numbers being proposed that are yeah. in excess of what. You're know, talking about up to forty. Up to forty units. Housing. So whether there's a potential of eighty-seven, whether there's a potential of ninety-four, it doesn't change the ability to ask for an application for forty units. But at this point, yes, we are just looking at the, the, the boundary the boundary line. We don't have any applications. We're not reviewing any applications. You know, we, the, the, the staff downstairs doesn't have a recommendation of approving or not approving the bathhouse because we don't have an application yet to compare to the rules. This is just whether we make that, make this area available to place that potential structure. Um, oh, uh, well, I just had like a side note thing, so go ahead, that's fine. No, I'm just, I'm just asking, I mean, it seems as if this whole premise to expand the district, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, but is prefaced by the orientation and location of the building, in the general location. And I guess that's what I'm questioning, just that, you know, the further up we put it up the hill makes it less walkable. And they, and um, it also completely does not orient to Berry Street. So I'm just wondering, you know, if there was other rationale for why it's located where it is, and in fact, not oriented towards Berry Street. Yeah, I could say that that it's mostly been the the perspective buyer of the property who's been walking the site. They doused it. They, you know, have really been just. It's it's more about the feel of the location than a specific, you know, and again, like, we're still trying to develop some different concepts for what that footprint looks like. And so um, we just, this is why that we're coming so early in this process is just to find out if this is even an option for us as we as we look at all these different approaches of the driveway and uh, road access, curb cut, there are a lot of different things in play. And so I can't, I'm not going to say it couldn't be done lower down. Yeah. It's, we're just trying to see like what all the possibilities are. I guess, I mean, just from the standpoint of keeping it walkable to Berry Street, which I assume it would have a sidewalk or some way of walking from Berry Street that didn't right. require walking in the drive. Um, pedestrian access for sure. Yes. And not just from Berry Street, but we're also looking at from like the upper part of the parcel and different locations. Um, it just seems to me that, well, this is just a personal observation that, that locating it closer to where the parking is actually located um, gives it more of a presence on your Berry Street. Yeah, I think we're not looking for a presence on Berry Street. We're trying to have it be private and But the zoning and in the Riverfront District is looking to have presence on Berry Street. Yeah. So that's, that's the question. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. the Phase 2 will definitely do. And part of it is also like leaving enough room along Berry Street to be able to really maximize the use of that. And how was that phase two area determined? Was there any kind of a layout that determined that was a space you needed to look? Not yet. But you have a number of units in mind. Yeah, but yeah. General number of units okay. at this point of a target. So just just how we should think about it, because um, I'm concerned about spot zoning issues. And about, I mean, like where I think our approach to this seems like it should be, do we think that this small section makes more sense as riverfront as envisioned in the zoning, you know, and, and this specific project and what we're seeing, it's interesting to, to know what's going to happen and it kind of informs just all of our planning thinking, but um, I don't think the specifics of the project should lead what we recommend here. Um, 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's sort of what I was thinking. Like, if we're looking at this, but this can change. This doesn't mean it's going yeah. to look like this. So the question isn't, what's the project? The question is, does it make sense that this parcel is in multiple zoning districts? It's also, I'm. Um, on the map, it's like this little tiny section of 24,000 that seems sort of out of place to me, too, so I don't know what the, did you explain that rationale and I missed it? It's, it's like a little block it, of it was, it, yeah, it, it's that whole area. Yeah, it yeah, came down to just this little piece here. comments and input from uh, neighbors and abutters and members of the council who were uh, concerned about having when when we recommended residential 6,000 for the entire section our thought was it's low density autumn all the way up what would happen is a developer would look at this and go and say I don't want to run roads and sewer all around here I'm gonna do a planned unit development and I'm gonna cluster it by the river and the top would get left as open space the City Council felt that was leaving too much to risk. They really wanted to make sure that um, they couldn't say no development in that district. You always have to allow something. So they chose to go with the lowest zoning density possible, which was um, residential 24,000. I mean, other than rural. There is a rural zoning district, but the rural is supposed to be designated for areas that don't have access to sewer and water because it has access to sewer and water um, if this got developed, the worst case scenario is it would be developed consistent with Town Hill in that type of manner. So um, I think the hope was that they would still not have much development, but that was the, the thought behind why this was the, the leg that's right behind Sabin Street, and then this section here in the middle would be low density zoning. If it gets developed, it'll be low density zoning and require riverfront and high density zoning right by the by the edge of the high of the road. How many square foot square feet does this change contemplate? Did you yeah. I don't think yeah, you figured I don't it think out. anyone's done the math I'm, to figure out. Ballpark can you I'm just Yeah that's what we were trying to figure okay. out. So one hundred it's, it's like, hundred feet on this side. Right. Do we know how long this side is? Roughly? It's called Two hundred. <laughs> What's the thirty by one twenty? That's the white. Yeah, that's, oh, that's the, the that's the box. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, it okay. looks like maybe three hundred by one fifty or something. Two hundred, so maybe two fifty. Yeah, it almost seems like you can't really look at this small piece of land <laughs> and say like this fits in this district yeah. or not. But if it's yeah. if it's if most of the zoning is correlates with property lines and this is doing that, and so it's not going to be coming up again, it seems fine. Yeah. But it's, not, it's not property lines, it's regardless not, oh. of what we do or what was done before. It's not property lines. It's just zoning uh, lines. Because the property is so big. Oh, so it's not correlating with property lines. No, it's I thought correlating with the zoning did. district line of the adjacent. Oh. No, this, so this parcel, oh, that's Barry okay. Street down there. This entire parcel is actually 18 acres in size. So oh, it's so right. Bigger yeah, it starts yeah. here oh, okay. and it goes all the way yeah, up behind and goes yeah, all the way up okay. to the back of McKinley Street. And so they're just not developing anything up top. Oh, okay. So is part of that in rural, up in that rural district also? In the 13 8, or it's all? It's in this 12 2. Right. Here's the actual yeah. parcel. If you guys want to look at a survey, oh, okay. it's, so it's, it's kind of small, but that's the actual survey of what the VCFA land looks like. So is it in, you said it was in three districts? It's here, here, and up here? Oh, the oh, yeah. separate lines on the yeah. 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 yeah, you can yeah. Kind of see it in oh, here. Okay. This oh, yeah. property yeah. outline. So you can see, jump, like, yeah. this so is what we're looking at. Yeah. So this, it keeps edge. going up oh, okay. this much. Yeah, I'm sorry for my yeah. misunderstanding. So the, yeah, the no, we should stream. have been better about yeah, explaining okay. the right. details. Okay. Yeah. It's all right, Mike. I don't even know. <laughs> you really stuck I'm on this now. Kind of job. I was just this back of the back of the envelope, yeah. complete estimate, all qualifiers out there. If this is if this is a hundred, then this is approximately two hundred and fifty going this way. Mm -hmm. It's going to be less than one hundred times two fifty, which would be twenty five thousand. Mm -hmm. Twenty five thousand square feet is give or take half an acre. Okay. Sorry, are you talking about the, the building? No. No. Okay. The change of part, the change of um, 
the amount of land is of going. It may be shifting a half an acre. Mm -hmm. It's probably less than that, but we'll back the envelope, call it a half an acre from 24,000 to Riverfront. So is this adjacent, the parcel next to it that's in Riverfront, that's within Sabin's Pasture, this like, this corner here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there a reason that that's different, but then so it just that stops? Whole is that because of the development potential of the and water? For anyone who can, who can see the screen, Sorry. the orange, you see there's a little orange piece, corner. and then there's a green piece that has the 13-8. Right, so that's the so the, yeah. Yep, if you add the 13.8 plus that little notch of orange, that is Saban's Pasture. So Saban's Pasture is about 100 acres. 85 acres going across is the green piece, which is all rural. The little orange piece is about 15 <laughs> acres of riverfront. Okay. That 15 acres of riverfront is the piece that roughly outlines the Trust for Public Lands project that was approved in 2008 in Act 250. It was never built, never moved forward on, but it was approved and it was agreed upon by the Trust for Public Lands in in cooperation, trying to negotiate with the Sabins, Save Sabins Pasture group, whatever it is. So that was that's why that line has a little bit of basis to it. There was a reason why that was picked. Um, just because it approximately allowed for that project to be recreated if somebody ever steps forward to recreate the trust for public lands. Um, that still sort of feels like spot zoning too, <laughs> right? <laughs> to just say, well, we have this project, which is sort of what we're contemplating yeah. now. We have this project, therefore let's change the zoning. And then we I, I think, I think a legal way process. to frame it yeah. <laughs> would yeah. be what well, there's no project that's being proposed but there's a potential one and and we're being asked to reconsider what our thinking is about the zoning and the future of this parcel and just thinking of it in, in the abstract and whether we want to revisit it um, and and does that include a recommendation to the city council potentially po potentially well, that's what we're trying to decide about what if we'll do that or not and i mean i think that we don't have we don't seem to have strong opinions so it's possible that we could be, I think it's possible to inform City Council that one we're neutral about it that um, is there a place for public opinion or public comment for here uh, here or at City Council yeah okay. yeah would you like to I would okay come on up you can introduce yourself uh, sure yeah like, again we don't have a motion or anything on the table right now so it's okay. this is this is well, it's great okay. it's great to hear I'm happy yeah. to do what I can to add to the conversation my name is Jeff Rubin. I'm the property owner on Barry Street to the west of the subject property. So, you can see one of the houses just on the corner of the big map. Within Riverfront? Yes, he's within with Riverfront. Yes. So, um, the, I, I, would, I would request that the planning board consider this perspective. The, um, the current way the zoning lines are drawn came about as a process, as I understand it. It started at uh, 300 feet from the center line of Barry Street, and then uh, the current or prior owner of the property petitioned for it to go to 450. Um, the, at, I believe the same time that the zoning was being considered, um, the uh, owners at Saban's Pasture also had uh, various reasons that they presented uh, their case uh, for, for 550 uh, from the center line, 550 feet from the center line of Barry Street. So um, I think that because we don't have um, a particular project in front of us, um, and because uh, Kate actually stated that you know it would be a good idea to maximize uh, Barry Street, and um, uh, they don't have a specific number of units, I would um, urge the planning board to recommend to the city council that um, uh, the, the zoning line should stay where it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, does anyone else have any thoughts? Aaron, did you? You go ahead. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the context is because I know I'm not comfortable changing it without understanding why it's there and understanding all of the context, which is why I'm asking questions about all this. And a lot of the context with a lot of the zoning was done here with the planning commission, but this is one where the city council kind of took over the decision making. Had a public hearing. And, and had a public hearing, and it was a more sensitive area, and it's something that we weren't as heavily involved in which to me uh, is a reason to defer to the city council since the city council had a vision here that was sort of i guess it was different than what the planning commission had at the time because they made changes and i'd just like to make a quick public comment too sure many of you already know me my name is joe castellano i live at free saving street if you look at the big blow up I am the second house in on Saban Street. Um, I do want to thank Kate for showing up, and I also want to thank, we had a preliminary meeting with both the uh, developer and Kate and some other people uh, early on, and they've been very cooperative and you know very easy to work with. My main concern about changing the zoning is right now with the current setbacks or everything, it goes up just a little past my house, and with the proposed zoning changes, you know, it looks to me like pretty much almost half of Saban Street, or most of the butters on Saban Street is impacted as opposed to just two uh, property owners at this point. So I kind of am concurring with Jeff Rubin that I would like to kind of keep it the same. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any other thoughts? Anyone have a motion? I was going to say the basis that we had was really in the memo that Barb had, which was really I just gave them four options, yeah. just because they didn't know what they wanted to do with it, so I gave them four options, and they. But did the final option actually end up being one of your four? No, they, they no. didn't pick any of your no, four. No, they, <laughs> they didn't pick any of them, <laughs> which is which is how we ended up with a map with the 550 on the one line and the 450 on the other. Right, because yeah. originally it was 450 all the way across. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. why the city council is much more familiar with what their logic and thinking oh. was than we are. Right. <laughs> or, or lack thereof. It was, <laughs> it was more sausage else. making than anything else, I think, would be. Um, yeah, I feel comfortable referring to the city council. I don't know if we need to make a formal motion, but Thanks for <laughs> I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, would you feel better with the motion since you're going to have to go to report? Or? Nope. The only thing, um, th so there were two. One was, was you know, whether you guys wanted to put a, any support or opposition to the change. And the other one was whether you um, think this is a substantial change to the zoning or whether. Um, so there was, oh I think it's about a half an acre. I don't feel strongly that it's substantial. I don't know. I mean, Do we have a definition or rule or statute? We, we pulled up the statute <coughs> and um, I try to pull that back up. Yeah, and really the impact of what, if it's if it's substantial, I mean there are two there are two options. If it's if it's reaches a certain point, then there could could be hearings. Well, there are going to be hearings. Or whatever happens Wednesday, it's just making recommendations for what is in the city council's public hearing draft. And the public hearing is set for September 11th and 25th. Yes. And that would be our public hearing? Their public hearing. Their, yes. public. their public hearing. So that would be their if it's if this is a substantial change, then they'll have to then it would have to come back and you know, if you guys are okay, Kirby and I can amend the required report to reflect this change. And yeah. I think that's okay. That's the, a lot of it's like taking yeah. Some of this is just <laughs> some of this is stuff that we would usually gloss over, but in other yeah. in, in certain cases, it makes sense to you know really get down to the nitty gritty of what specifically it says in four 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 two. So yeah, twenty four VSA forty four forty two sub B. 
about an amendment of a proposal. It says the legislative body may make minor, and this is be the legislative body of the city, so city council, may make minor changes to the proposed bylaw amendment or repeal, in this case, the regulation of the zoning regs, but shall do so, uh, shall not do so less than 14 days prior to the final public hearing. And this is, and this is the part that, that we're trying to understand here. It says, if the legislative body at any time makes substantial changes in the concept, meaning, or extent of the proposed bylaw amendment or repeal, it shall be, shall warn a new public hearing. In this case, Mike, though, isn't this, isn't this about, is this before a regulation? Yeah, we haven't, become, yeah, so we haven't had a public hearing. So the first piece doesn't matter. It's the second piece of that clause. But does it because we haven't warned the public, we haven't had a public hearing yet. Had we already had our first public hearing, it would could necessitate us going back and rewarning another first public hearing, but we haven't had a first public hearing. So read the second half of the sentence. So if the legislative body at any time makes substantial changes in the concept, meaning, or extend the proposed bylaw amendment or repeal, it shall warn a new public hearing or hearings under subsection A of this section. So your question is: Is the the notice that's already been given is it good enough for this? If we if we decide to throw this in halfway through, isn't there another sentence after that? Uh, if any part of the propo proposal is changed, the le legislative body at least 10 days prior to the hearing shall file a copy of the changed proposal with the clerk or of the municipality and with the planning commission. And the planning commission? The planning commission shall amend the report prepared pursuant to subsection 4441C of this title to reflect the changes made by the legislative body and shall submit that amended report to the legislative body at or prior to the public hearing. It's only a substantial change. So it, yeah, it's it it's identify what a substantial change. It is. doesn't. It doesn't. But the fact that they've come in and talked to you, if you've got enough information given to Kirby, if the city council agrees on Wednesday to make this change, then it goes into the warrant document. We have comes back to us. To, to rewrite the required report to reflect the fact that there is a approximately a quarter acre change in the zoning district line. And then we have to refile that required report back to city council. So they're here two days early rather than 12 days afterwards, because if we waited 12 days for us to do the required report in this planning commission meeting, then we'd miss the deadlines and have to start warning different warning schedules so it just works better if we've got an idea of and really all the required reports going to do is say what's the impact it's we're, we're, we're jumping through legal hurdles but it was just to make sure you guys if you guys think it's substantial then we will definitely be coming back so are we gonna have to vote on whether it's substantial or not no no it's just this is just a matter of what to do next we can make t we can make two recommendations to the city council. It sounds like one we can make a recommendation as to whether or not this constitutes a substantial change. Number two is we can. Sounds like the recommendation that we can make is whether we approve the city council placing this on its agenda for public hearing, because that's the next step, right? That's what's discussed. It. On Te Wednesday. Yeah, technically, well, you you would. So we wouldn't even. Be you would support it being on the change. On, on yeah. the right, I'm just on the. At the I say better be safe than sorry and treat it as a substantial change. Actually, that's my thinking. Yep. Why be vulnerable? When we're talking about a section of the city that's controversial. Uh, so we've got substantial change, and do you want to have a vote on being neutral, supporting? Can I, I'd like to make a motion as to whether to, uh, a motion to uh, determine whether or not this is a substantial change or not, and what we, and if we report whether or not it's a substantial change to the city council. It's not a good wording for the motion, but. So your motion is. The motion, the motion is. Whether we consider it a substantial change. Correct. <clears throat> First. Um, could we could we phrase it as we don't know but suggest treating it as a substantial change that would be the motion I would be in favor of Second. what the motion is 
I don't think I don't think we're required to declare that it's a substantial change or not. It's just whether or not this the procedure should be followed. I it's a little bit of make, I yeah. make a motion <laughs> to decide whether or not we are going to make a recommendation to the city council as to whether or not this is a substantial change or not. And your motion is to decide. Is to decide whether to make a recommendation to the city council regarding yeah. the substantial change determination. Okay. So we so we can discuss that. Is there any discussion? <laughs> All right. it's a confusing process. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think fundamentally that what's mm -hmm. been determined is, is we can make a recommendation, but we're not required to. So I mean, it's just sort of a threshold question as to whether or not we even want to make that recommendation to the to the city council. I, I don't know. I just I guess my only thought is that if we yeah, I mean, I I guess I'm probably inclined to what you said to follow the process to be careful, but if we declare it to be substantial change or not are we setting precedent for other things that may come up that we want to have flexibility about or I don't know development is so you know tricky and I just want to be able to have some flexibility about how the city changes and I, don't know. I don't feel great about making a legal interpretation when we haven't really researched any case law or like we haven't really given it the proper background that's why all right how about uh, we have a motion to recommend to council to treat this request as a substantial change and to move forward with the process of amending the required report. So we are determining that, then that, that it is not, a substantial Well, we're not saying it is. We're just recommending to council to treat this request as a substantial change. We're not saying it is a substantial change. We're just saying we don't know, so we might as well treat it as the worst case scenario, oh, yeah. which is a substantial change. That's, yeah. a, that's a different motion. Than what I and mean. to move forward with the process of amending the required report. That is that is different. That would be a different. That's yeah. A different. So what Aaron's asking is whether we're going to make any recommendation at all on right. this issue. This is just a question of whether or not we're going to make a recommendation. Emphasis on recommendation, <laughs> not a determination. What a, does anyone have thoughts? Or do we want to do we want to vote on that? We have a second. We don't have a second. Oh, is that do we have a second? I don't know if people are interested. Enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making us have the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you read what you, I would move, I think, what you proposed. So it was a, a motion to recommend to council to treat this request as a substantial change and to move forward with the process of amending the required report. So, would they amend the amending the report means that they they would be doing that if they were agreeing to make this change? So does that we would be re amending the required right. report? Right. So does that motion say that we're saying we're recommending they approve this change? Treat the request or just that we're thing. considering and it if, substantial. And if and all right. So then, what if there was treat this request as a substantial change and if approved? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's Good call. <laughs> because I don't want the, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable making move. this change. I'm happy. I think that they should have the discussion. I don't, it, I have no problem with the proposed design specifically. I just don't know that that's the reason to make this change. So I think city council needs to discuss it. So I'm not comfortable telling them that they should or should not do it. Yeah. So this would just be a this would just be a, 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 a motion of, of kind of almost a formality to let them know that our recommendation is to assume this is a substantial change. We'll move forward with a that process, and separate from that, it's the planning commission doesn't have a recommendation one way or the other unless after we approve this or don't approve this, we have a separate second motion. 
So, so I, I will move that motion <laughs> as amended by Stephanie. <laughs> I will second. Okay. So all those in favor uh, of the motion as recorded by Mike, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. One, two, three. We get yeah. I. Yeah, I don't. Four. Yeah. Okay. I shouldn't have said I because I don't vote unless I need to, right? Well, you had to in this one. Oh, to get four the, to one to get four. Yeah. All right. Any other motions? Are we done? Uh, do we have any other motion? Do we have a recommendation? I think we discussed earlier that we don't even necessarily need, don't need a motion right. if we have no recommendation. The recommendation otherwise okay so i guess we're done all right thank you kate mm -hmm. thank you everyone who came in to thank you to inform yeah, you're, you're very yeah. deliberative <laughs> <laughs> yes we are <laughs> yes, <you're right. laughs> we can't be, yeah we can't be accused of <laughs> skimming it <laughs> okay well moving on on the agenda then we can get into a uh, discussion of the boundary for a design review district. So last meeting we talked about what our suggestions would be to, to change what the Historic Preservation Committee and, and also the Design Review hey, Committee. I'm sorry, did we skip number seven? Oh, we did skip number seven. Um, thanks, Aaron. Uh, so, so, so there's an item on here to continue review of the proposed design review standards. I. At my understanding is we're, we're, our plan was to wait to hear back from Historic Preservation about our suggestions, and then we'll, we will kind of officially get the regs at that point. We get another bite at that apple, and then it will go to City Council. So until that we hear back from them, I don't think we have any more to discuss. Because we had made our recommendations for changes. Yeah, we had a vote last time. So, uh, but, if, but if anyone has anything left over from that, I guess, I mean, it's on the agenda. So do we have? Any comments about that? Okay, so so I'll move on to you now. Um, so the, the boundary. So in the context of, of that of a, of what we did last time, we need to we need to decide what our initial preliminary kind of recommendation for a boundary will be. That's really important though to, to highlight that this is a preliminary thing because we're going to have public hearings. We're going to hear from people. Um, so there's going to be a plenty of input from here, but basically what do we want as our starting place for what this design review boundary is going to be. And with that, I can hand it to Mike with an intro of things to consider. Four more. So this was the I had made a just made a bunch of maps and some of them say the same thing in different ways. So oh. there's another one. Oh there is. Oh no. I'm just gonna oh. thank you. I did ask for all the maps, so I think this might have been oh, there. I think so. Are you I'm going to scoot over. Sure, Did you want to come sit up here and be part of it? Yeah. I don't want that. Yeah. 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 yeah, we've got, mm -hmm. got the room. Got the room. So, you know, I'll start with this one. So just by way of orienting everybody, this is probably the nice first one to, to start to look at. The blue line, the light blue line that goes around is our existing design control district. What you see in red is our current historic district. Our historic district also includes the capital complex. So that white donut actually is, is part of the historic district as well. Um, so is that for the historic district for the designated downtown? This is the historic district for the National Register. The National Register, okay. Oh. This is the design control district. And the third line, <laughs> Just because, as I said, nothing seems to line up. Uh, the third one? There was that one. Oh. There we go. Oh. So, 
This one I printed out because of the dark blue. What you see here, the dark blue on the top and the bottom, which tends to blend into the river a little bit, but that's the designated downtown. So at a minimum, design review must cover this dark blue area. Now I didn't have a map that had the dark blue and the National Register and the design control, but okay. it helps to give you an idea. This was the minimum that so we have to cover, which is why do we have to? Part of the for the designated downtown. for the designated downtown. The adapted, part of the adapted oh, does conform with the designated downtown. <laughs> part of it does. Mm -hmm. Yes, this nose that sticks out nose, here yeah. um, does match the designated downtown. That's but, something. But, that's like we have to but as it goes up, register. it gets different. And okay, so the current blue line. It has the entire designated downtown in it. Yes. But the, it does not line up with the National Register. Yep. Line. And it doesn't really match the, it only matches the designated downtown on Berry Street. After it leaves Berry Street, it doesn't match anything. Okay. Um, and then you can see the rest of these lines. Um, and this is where we were talking, especially if you're talking about like um, Liberty Street and, and some of these other Loomis and Liberty, some of these streets up here that are in the National Register Historic District but are not in the design review right now. Those are the areas that we had issues when we proposed changes because we were going to redraw the blue line to match the red, which is why this map exists. This map was created to make that argument that this blue line should match the red and we'll regulate the red as design control. And we got taken to task on that. Um, and then if you look really carefully, there are a couple of spots where there are even some parcels that are not in the National Register, but are in the designated downtown or in the design control. So really where we're at now is where do we want to, you know, what do we want to think about? Um, so the National Register, what, my understanding is Anything we do about deciding what this design review boundary is going to be doesn't directly impact the National Register. So the National Register is sort of more informative of what of what's seen as historical from that one perspective, right? Like, if ours doesn't line up, it's not going to hurt anything. Kind of. So just to keep things... I'll keep throwing things out, and at some point, everybody will go and say, that's enough, I've got enough, I'm all full. Um, so we are a designated downtown, which means we have to enforce this. I've already mentioned that. We are also a certified local government, a CLG, which is for historic preservation. As a part of CLG, you are also expected to have regulations to protect historic structures in your community. We kind of do that in some places of our historic district, but not all of it. Now, I haven't heard from them that they will threaten to throw us out of CLG for not meeting all of the National Register. Because we don't right now. Because we don't right now, but I've, I've heard comments from them so we may at some point hear from somebody from Devin or somebody who says that we should be or we're expected to or you know you can be stripped of your CLG for not protecting all of these ones out here um, I don't know what they're gonna say but that's that's just a piece of information that's still floating out there because th they'll come in and tell us well, you can't make the designated down, you can't make the design review smaller because then you're not protecting the historic structures and we're going to throw you out. And I'm like, but we already aren't. So I don't know. So we don't but know if we should be. We don't know. They haven't. But we're that, not that's, 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 that's going to be part of the process. That will be part <laughs> of the process. But <laughs> it, is, it is one of these ones that, cool. I mean, part of the, the, uber philosophical thing is well you know one of the best ways to protect your historic resources is by regulations and you know you, we should match the design control boundary to match our historic so that way we're 
we've got a, we've got an inventory of the historic resource. We should protect those items that are on the historic resource. But once you reach the political realities of these are a lot of single family homes and we're starting to get in on, you know, people who are commercial have access to tax credits. People who are single family residential do not have access to tax credits and therefore it's a different burden for them than for the commercial people when we say you have to maintain the historic integrity of this building. You have to maintain the slate roof that needs to be replaced. Mike, can, can I take a step back? Just let's yep. start with the easy parts that are currently included in the design control district that we can't actually justify. Mm -hmm. For example, the area around the college, currently it's in the design control district. Do we actually have any say S as a city? Small amounts. Um, yes. And it's it's a matter of d discussion between different things. Um, uh, you know, Meredith is uh, my zoning administrator. Our zoning administrator is much more of the opinion that we can be regulating more. The limitations on zoning, the 44 one, three limitations that are in there are, are really um, a set of things that we can and can't regulate, and we can regulate more than, you know, I'm typically saying that we can't regulate the college. And she's of an opinion we can regulate more than some of the college. Yeah, we can regulate some of the college. Uh, they get they get some leniency, not full leniency. How's that? Um, so it it could make sense, but at the same time. It's it you know it's it's a I think it's a policy thing. To, it's kind of strange to have the island sitting out here, but yeah. you know CCV is not on this map. It's also CCV way out in Elm Street is also a parcel. You know, if you want to talk about spot zoning, there it is. Just the, the college. Because it has different zoning districts. It's well, they put both colleges when it was Woodbury College and mm -hmm. maybe Woodbury and whatever, but Norwich then they put them both in. Um, Who made that decision? Planning Commission and City Council a long time ago. So we could change it? Yeah. Yeah, we could go and recommend that CCB should no longer be in a design review district. It's not historic. CCB certainly isn't. Right. And National Life. And right. National Life. Uh, and that's where it comes back, back to the discussion of, okay, well, we've got those, you know, those written purpose statements of what we're trying to do, and where does it make sense for us to to draw that line? Well, the new language is very historic focused, it's not just a design control. It's a really heavier weight, heavier weight put on historic. Yeah. And as currently drawn, the design control district includes the parcel we were just discussing. Uh, this is an old map. At that same. DRB or at that same city council public hearing where they made those lines, they also adjusted the, they took this piece oh, out of out. design review, okay. but the top part of that parcel is still in design review. Because at the time, VCFA was thinking we're going to subdivide the parcel, we'll keep that upper piece and we'll sell this bottom piece. After that, they went through and just put the entire piece on the market without subdividing. And the people who came in tonight have a purchase and sale for the entire parcel. So that is not, so that currently is not in. It's not in design. design. Review. No. But the top half still is. The top, the, the top little piece is. Yep. I'm confused by the changing zoning because someone's planning to do something that they don't actually do because that's come up a couple times tonight. That's another example of we changed something. It draws, but it makes a difference between what's possible and what's not possible. I mean, yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, in some cases it's, you know, um, and, and in the case when the proposals came in, there weren't proposals for either one of these parcels when the city council was debating them. They just made a decision on November 1st about both of these parcels and then Two weeks later, on November 15th, they came back in and 
Doug Zorzi came in and made a big argument for Saban, so they changed Saban's again, and so then they didn't match. But okay. It's arbitrary and arbitrary. Okay. We recommended something different. <laughs> yeah. So what are what are our thoughts on a starting place? Um, the obvious one, of course, is the um, downtown. I'm going to start getting these different designations. Designated downtown. The designated downtown is where we could start. Uh, one option would be to put over top of that the um, the red on this one, right? National the uh, the National uh, Register boundary. Yep. Put the designated downtown on that one. One on top of the other, yeah. So that so that everything in each one's included, and I mean that that's one. Yeah. Um, I don't see a reason for us to go with um, the design control as it is now, but that I mean that is an option. But um, uh, the other option, there was another map set of maps that went around the zoning map. Yep. Which is it's really blown. It really kind of small but I kind of sent it out just because in all of this hodgepodge of stuff you can see the black outline of the design control district so you have something to start to reference we can also use you know, we've got this but we also have neighborhoods identified on this map and we also have zoning districts on this map so we could go through and start to add in to go through and say well if we're going to stop it let's stop this one you know we'll take the mixed use and the urban and the riverfront and we'll make those you know that type of thing where we pick certain things to go through and say these neighborhoods should be part of design review um, and kind of add them in that's just another option that could be then expanding beyond the historic district yeah. Yeah, because some of the neighborhoods it could be smaller than it could split. be larger than it depends really where you where you pick and choose it could end up being a reason why Liberty and Loomis don't end up in because we say neighborhood you know you can see on this oh, 10, on this 9, map 10, you have 10, a little 10, green 8.3 and then you have a little 9-3. If we say 8-3 is going to be regulated as part of design control, 9-3 is not that neighborhood, then... But right now, 9-3 is part of the historic district. It's not in the end. No, it's not. Yeah. 9-3 is not. It's not. Up to Graham Terrace? No. 9-3 9 is not. Part of 8-3 is. It's part of the historic Well, you can see the black line is on the map. No, yeah, I'm talking about the historic district. Oh, the historic district, yes. yes. They are yes. both in the historic. So if you were to look at this map, 8-3 and 9-3 are both in the historic district, as well as a big chunk of 10-2 is also in the historic district. Well, a chunk, maybe not a big chunk. Uh, relatively well, small chunk edge. No, because those are actually part of 7-1, aren't they? Or 7-6. Yeah. So I think 10-2 or is... 10-2 10, 10 is probably out. Outside. But, but it gives you it gives us another thing if we want yeah, to not be over. arbitrary. Yeah, we can go through and say, pick this neighborhood, pick this neighborhood, pick this neighborhood. In the neighborhood description, they would probably say they're historic, and we can just go through and say, well... Does the, Do we want to make an overlay then to show that? I well, mean, you can give me some ideas. I can go back, draw some lines, and then maybe have um, the RPC put together a map that says, um, here are the neighborhoods that you told me to pick, here's the existing designated downtown, and here's the existing historic district. You basically take this map and put some other information on it for you. Okay. Does, does the current designated downtown split any of our zoning neighborhoods? I right think now. it does. I, yeah. That's one idea, to go along with kind of what Mike's trying to say, is to make sure our neighborhoods stick together and are treated as units, is to take the designated downtown, but then expand it a little bit to make sure that every neighborhood that it touches is 
fully included? Well, it's sort of like we have least. Because I don't know what, what that would be. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't think it would expand it a lot. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. My, I guess my desire would just be to keep it to the downtown, designated downtown. Um, but I, you know, I'm sure other people have different opinions. Um, and I just wonder how, like, how how cohesive people feel. I mean, people are going to feel, it's possible that people feel pissed. You know, at some point you're going to draw a line between neighbors. And I don't know how cohesive Depends what's going on. Yeah. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it until somebody proposes something, and then people want it because they want to beat up their neighbors with it. <laughs> I mean, it, it still seems sort of crazy to have this piece, um, historic design district, but not have it reviewed. So we've got a significant amount of the dis historic district not under design control or design review. And we can certainly put together a couple of maps because I think the sense was we were going to come up with an idea or some ideas that we can go to the public to start putting out feelers for to see what, you know, and your thought might be, well, let's go bigger. Um, let's try to include more of the historic. We're trying to protect the horse historic resources. Let's include more of the historic resources. Um, you know, Ariane might be like, well, let's keep it smaller and, and really focus on, on the downtown core and what, what's important and what we have to protect. And, um, we can hear from the public on where they want. I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages both ways. It, so what's the point of having some areas designated in the historic district if they're not under design review? If they're residential? It's, it's a, well, it's, it's part of the National Register. It's just, it's just a survey of what's out there. And it's, it's purely information here's the information, right. do with it what you want, and you might choose a subset of those to protect. You might protect them all. Um, it's just information at this point. Um, one, one thing is that residential could become commercial. I mean, so just because it's currently residential doesn't mean that it's useless to be in that district. No, but if it's mostly single or you know, one or two family homes, it's unlikely that it's going to suddenly become commercial. Yeah, we can look at, um, and the zoning districts will give you what the possible uses are. It won't tell you what is on the ground, but in a lot of cases we did try to match them. So you do have yeah. some mixed use residential MUR 7 7, but these. 8-2 and 8-3 are residential 1500 so those are just residential there's no commercial in those other than commercial apartments but there's no commercial development in those um, I'm thinking about apartments I feel like yeah, I feel like apartments take you make use of the credits a lot right yeah in, in some cases they do so I mean we could just start looking at these the greens the oranges and the reds really kind of make up a core of, and this blue 2 1, which is its own unique piece, um, kind of make up their own. And most of those are in the district. Oh, yeah. Also 9 3. Yeah, I mean, I think if we outlined most of our, a lot of our district boundaries already do match the historic boundaries. Oh, I see. Yeah, they're, 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 they're fairly close, yeah. I mean, 9 3, 7 6. I mean, one advantage is that the new map. This was a revised map in 2016. So this revised map follows parcel lines. Our zoning districts follow parcel lines. So if they look kind of close, chances are good they're actually the same. So 
Are you saying that this is not the one that, this is not the full historic? That district? is the full historic. It district. is? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. And includes Cliff Street? Yes. You will see the squigglies up here for yes. Cliff Street. Yeah. This blue line is actually, you know, you're mentioning it. Yes, the blue line here is actually wrong for this because they asked to get cut out. So if you were to look at this map here, you'd follow them. But they, they, when they went to city council, they got that cut out. But it is in the National Register District. And they asked to get cut out of design And review. they got cut out of design review at the request of the property owners. But it was open to reinterpretation by the, the council. The council did say they were open to putting it back in. We might not want to argue that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you pick, pick your battles pick carefully. Pick your battles, exactly, yeah. This will, we will be opening up those walls and filling it with Cliff Street residents. <laughs> But again, that could, if, if we were looking at, you know, where the neighborhoods are, that's a light blue neighborhood, which is just residential. Um, that was cut out already. Mike, earlier, previously, when we did propose that the design review should match the historic district, other than Cliff Street, was there objection from other neighborhoods? Yes. Uh, there was quite a lot. From, I always mix up my liberties and Loomis. I think it's Loomis. Sandy Vitsum um, spoke want very. Part. Didn't want to be part of it. Did design. not want to be in it. I, mean, I imagine we're going to get some strong feelings from anyone if we're trying to increase. I'm likely to face some sort of. Yeah, I mean, I think if there was a subtle push that went through and said, look, half of this neighborhood is currently design review, we're going to make the whole thing design review, and, you know, I, I think there may be some grousing and grumbling, but I think at a certain point... That's more of a fairness thing. That's more of a that fairness thing to go through and say, we, we don't want an arbitrary line. We decided to match it to the neighborhoods. Either your whole neighborhood is in or your whole neighborhood is not going to be in. And so we, right now, Cliff 11-1, all of that is out right now? Okay, so that already now with that cutout matches. Yes, the with a teeny tiny exception, but yeah. we don't need to get into we'll that. That's that. because of this this little one parcel. They had requested back when the designated downtown was made. These guys wanted access to historic tax credits, so they could renovate one Cliff Street, whatever the first mm -hmm. house on because Cliff Street. Because it's on the designated downtown. And because it was in designated downtown, they were able to get access. So they petitioned and they ran the designated downtown up to loop them in, even though they're really not a, a designated downtown. That's a, all over the place. Yeah. So okay, great. that was a little. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I think we could we could think about this strategically in that if we're going if we're going to put something out there for people to think about and give us an opinion on, if we first throw out a, a small area people might think that they're not included, so we might not hear from them. So then if we expand it later, we, that could lead to trouble. We could also throw out something bigger just to get all of the feedback possible and then trim it down. I mean, I'm not saying proposing anything. I think we anything, have to have a rationale for whatever we propose. It's, and going, to, so it's I, going to determine our future, which of those two we use. It would really help to maybe have those neighborhoods identified as an overlay Mike, so that we have some rationale for what we might choose. So, if is it possible to overlay those? Yeah, I can. I, I just kind of gave you a scatter yeah. shot of right. no, it's great. ideas. Yeah. And then we, I can go back and try to pull in some additional maps that go and say, boy, I kind of like that idea of matching our design control to neighborhoods. And if that's the thing, then I can go through and match it up to neighborhoods and say, these are all the commercial and or mixed use neighborhoods in the downtown and then put an outline of where here's the current design review here's the designated downtown and here's here's the net yeah here's the national register line and you'll kind of have an idea of, oh all right it's 
it's leaving out this neighborhood and it's leaving out this neighborhood and leaving out this neighborhood, but it's captured the core of who we really would want to regulate and design. Mike, can you tell me what the criteria are for national registry? Registration? Uh, Designation? The, I am not an expert. I will give you a general understanding of it. Um, so there are two sets. There is the individual structures, and then there are districts. This is Montpelier's historic district, which includes a couple hundred buildings. Um, individual things can also be added in. Um, but you have to be a minimum of 50 years old. Um, I mean, at the time it was passed, it was passed in 76, maybe? So it was like basically 50 years was getting us back to the anything the before the 20s. the 20s. Yeah, so those buildings built in the 20s are all historic. Well, now, you know, now my Prairie Ranch built in 1971 is coming into being a historic structure because they never, they didn't fix anything fit more than 50 years old. So it qualifies as historic, and then it depends whether it has continuous habits. Yeah, so Defining not all features. structures are historic in it. Somebody just walk, you know, creates a line, but not all structures. They're, yes. They're, the, they're evaluated, though. Yes. If they're within the historic district. They're evaluated as either contributing or... Contributing or non-contributing. Or non-contributing. And who yeah. makes that decision? That was done by the professional. That was done by the consultant who did the register. Now the register is but for the city. For the city. Yeah. For the city. Yeah. No, it's just a, distinguishing. It's not a federal decision. No. Okay. Yeah, we make. Yeah, they put together the documentation. It gets sent to the feds. The feds approve it. So they do get a have a review process for it. Um, but what the district? How the district kind of differs from the individual is the district is intended to capture a whole bunch of things of a certain period. Um, so most communities will have, within an area this size, might have, um, I live in Hardwick. I think the village of Hardwick has four historic districts because this group was built in the 1840s. This was the 1860s to 1890s. These were all the ones built in 1910, and these were the ones that were built, and they were separate historic districts because they followed different architectural styles. Most of downtown Montpelier, according to this survey, falls into the same development pattern. I'm guessing maybe because we had a big habit of burning down our downtown on a periodic basis. <laughs> oh, okay. And yeah, so therefore, purposely. we don't have 1840s buildings in our downtown because they were burned down in 1860, which were then burned down in 1880, which were then burned down in 1910. So that's well, my guess that why we have a big historic <laughs> district. Well, we, yeah, I mean, we never had... A it. big single historic that's district. That's what he talked about, is that it could have been broken up mm -hmm. into yeah. separate districts, like which is more typical. Yeah, more typical that, right. but I it's, think... It hasn't been. It, it, ours wasn't, it. yeah. If we go through the process of breaking out design review from historic preservation review, we could have two different districts with two different rules apply. Something stopping us, right? There's no zoning rules or, uh, pro, uh, with the National Historic mm. District. That's no. just, uh, yeah. Well, I think just because the, or you're just saying, because the current update to the regulations that you guys have done at the last meeting that I missed, but that's very specific to historic. So there are other things in here that might have well, other design well, review, but that. What we looked at had, separate. it had subsections on, it had some sections that were on just general design review yeah. and some were that were historic specific. So we could break those out and have two sets of regs that apply to, and we got two maps, one set of regs apply to one, one set of regs apply to the other. If we want either historic or design review, one or the other, to be larger than the other. Uh, so like the design review would be a larger line and the historic would be within, like as a subset of that larger? I guess it doesn't Or, or there could be, or you could do one which has slightly less strict standards. You could have a very... You know, a much stricter set of rules that apply to the commercial district and have a softer set of standards or less 
or not all of the standards. You know, standards one through ten apply in the downtown, and one through four apply in this other district. And if we, if we, I should throw that out there. If we get to a place where we're, we're not, where there's not a lot of agreement about how the boundaries should be um, set out, then we could go that way. Um, Can I just ask a process question? Um, you know, you mentioned if we did the downtown designation and people thought they were left out and then they got added back in later, um, they might be upset. But would people get notified if they're added back in later at all? Or The point I was making is if we throw something out there for the public to look at and to come comment on, right. if we then expand it later, right, right. people say, hey, I didn't, I didn't get yeah, a chance. You, you know, so okay. that's, Yeah, I guess my question yeah. was, yeah, exactly that. If we expand it later, when would that happen? Like, how quickly would that happen? Like, I guess people wouldn't get notified. I'm just not understanding and the process of how once that. They would get notified. But they would get yeah. notified. But I think it's, in it time would be better that to start, comment. yeah, with the bigger one, and then if that causes difficulty to shrink it down. Um, so then I guess my next question would be the, the CLG process. Is the Division of Historic Preservation the one who determines, ultimately approves that? Yeah, they will. They will see whatever map we draw. So, again, like I said, I look at this and go and say, we're already not regulating a bunch of these, but I'm waiting to hear what their comment will be, based on whatever we draw for a line. So, and then we just have to respond to that. So we will get their comments before we take it to the public. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm not too concerned about that. And I think it's, it would be really problematic if they did tell us that we had to stick with this because that's letting this what, kind of third party take over the soft, some of the sovereignty of the city of Montpelier. I don't know. I don't think they'll, I don't think that they'll make us stick with what's in, what's just what's on the register and what it says. It just doesn't seem like. So their problem, again, is that we have historic properties outside of the district. So they would want the district to match. I think that's where CLG would come down, okay. where the Division of Historic Preservation would come down. But I think sometimes we've got to call the question on them, maybe, to see, are we calling their bluff, or are they really <laughs> are they really going to go and write a letter to the National Park Service and have us thrown out of the CLG program because, you know, we're protecting only 500 of our 800 buildings in the historic district, or whatever the numbers are? I think if that does happen, I would love to, for them to put it in writing and to actually analyze what their rationale would be for that. Well, that was brought up before by the Historic Preservation Commission that yep. we could be in trouble with our CLG intervention. Yeah, they've, they've, yeah, they've made, made comments before on our proposals. Well, maybe we need some time to digest this and, and bring it back next time. With, do you with have a the specific map? request of what, do you, do you have something you'd like me to start putting together? I would love to see the map that actually has the structures on it. Yeah, which one? Which that's, one? yeah, that, you guys have that one somewhere. That yeah, one. and um, maybe, I'd like to see neighborhoods overlaid somehow. Um, maybe it'd be better in the big map, the red, red and blue map. But I'll, yeah, I'll try to print bigger maps. Because we kind of know the peripheral area if we're just focusing on this. So we're looking at neighborhoods and designated downtown and... Neighborhoods meaning zoning. Yes. District. Yes. And the National Register, Register Boundary. boundary. Thinking two, if it's if it's all the same work, I think it would be helpful to have two.
two different ones. Two different maps. Okay. One we'll that's one that's neighborhood zoning with designated downtown, and one's neighborhood zoning with the national national register. Okay. So that we could compare those two. Sorry, what was your second one? Your second one was the, it, one that has neighborhood zoning and national register only. There's those two things. So, yeah. Um, at, with overlays, another one that has neighborhood zoning with designated downtown overlays, and then we could compare those two maps with one another okay. to see. Sure. Can the current boundary be on there too, so we can see, like with the I want to see the current boundary with the zoning, so I know if there's like a little section right. or two that don't quite match that we could just say, oh, well, if we add that, then we're actually in the Yeah, it's zoning. probably just going to be a black line, so it won't interfere too much in it, so. Okay. But with the other layers, would be okay. At least we could start to look at some rationales for whatever we might recommend. Well, this one is, is this one current? Yeah, I just, I couldn't zoom into this, basically really kind of zoom right into this block and then have them print out a bigger map of the zoomed in area. But this is the this, this is, is the existing zone plus design control plus design control. yeah so oh, we right. have so we, we have, have that already that, oh, but well. I think it's it's hard to read it would be cool. helpful to see with out, with these other outlines I yeah. think so that we can see how close this ones at this dark district aligns with that I don't Seems like a plan. We can do that first thing next meeting, but um, we should maybe we'll devote the rest of this meeting to, for a quick discussion about planning, planning our planning. Um, do we do we besides the boundary next week? I mean, I, I think we were planning to go back to the city plan. Um, does everyone want to do that? Yeah. Discuss that. Boundary. Basically, next meeting, um, it's, we're not we're not going to, in this meeting. We're not going to conclude um, have a vote on the boundary, so we'll have to pick that up at next meeting. Uh, is there anything else that we should do before getting back to the city plan? I mean, my my thoughts are that once we get back to the city plan, let's get back into it, you know, deeply and and, and, and start being focused entirely on that. Um, so I guess if there's anything related to this stuff that we want to do before we get back to city plan. I mean, this is sort of ancillary to this map making thing. I'm a little concerned. That, I mean, we could stare at these maps all day. And, and I think what might be beneficial is to have like a real focused discussion on what, what we want to achieve through Design Review Authority, because I, I mean, it's a little unclear to me what the policy rationale for determining this, these boundaries are right now, absent that discussion. And I don't know that yeah. we can have it right now, but you know, we, it, it seemed, we, we had a bunch of that in, in, in this. It's, this is these are kind of the rules, and they had laid out there. Yeah, I, this is the design. Review. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, I. I but there is kind of looking I, at both and then rereading this. With an eye towards yeah, that. I, mm -hmm. I think we really need to sort of. Yeah, I understand that, and I, I see that more as a kind of more of a process document than a, than a policy document. Maybe that's just my new. If I'm, well, they yeah, they inserted at the start a bunch of policy things, yeah. a bunch of the whys. I mean, things I don't know necessarily think I would have inserted in this document, but it was fine because it added context to what they were trying to do. I think I know what you're getting at, and that's and that's as a group, what are we trying to achieve with right. the boundary? I think that this informs it in that, well, we know about how rigorous these regulations are going to be because we went we combed through them now. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, how much of the residents of Montpelier do we expect to comply with these? Weighted against how we want neighborhoods to look. Well, and, and hopefully with the new um, regulations that have been written or proposed, that the public would have more confidence in the design review process than they have in the past. So we would have less 
concern about people, neighborhoods being included, because they would feel like they knew what was going to be Done. And I think that's part of the discussion. Well, how, do, how does everyone feel about where the, where the regulations are right now? I mean, my, my impression of them is that they're more detailed now. There's more of them to have to follow. There's some of the administrative process is now streamlined, and so it's easier in some ways for the small stuff. But in some way, you could definitely look at this as an expansion of what's being regulated. Right. I just, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is I think we, you, we've got to have a serious just you know, a pretty focused discussion because I, I take your point, Barbara, but I'm assuming there's going to be some property owners that we say, oh, don't worry, it's okay. It's a 17-page document that explains this all now. And that, you know, it's going to create unnecessary confidence in the process, but it might do the opposite. So, um, I don't know. That's just sort of what's spinning around in my head as I'm looking at these maps. As I'm, trying to, I'm trying to grapple with what it is ultimately. And I guess a little, a little bit of what I would throw out for for chewing on is we're working on all these things to come up with an idea that we're really – this is just going to be an idea we're going to float to the public. Mm -hmm. And so in a certain sense, we have some rules. we got a good idea. They're, they're not cast in stone, and let's put together a map. It's not cast in stone, and let's start to – we're not sure if this is exactly what we want, but let's start to get some feeling from the public. Because if we get, which was happened last time, 65 people in this room and 60 of them come up and speak against it, and that's what we got hit with. And because we pretty much came out and yeah. said, we can't do this. I mean, right, we're, 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 we'd be killing the entire zoning process if we try to pass design review changes because, you know, everybody except for, you know, I, I could probably name the five people who came out and fit in support of the design control changes. Um, and part we, of the argument was that they, looking at past um, evaluations, mm -hmm. they felt that it was capricious. Yeah. And so now the commission has come forward with this, this document for us to look at and say, okay, there are more defined regulations now. So then as a result of that, perhaps the negative comments would not be as long as people understood it, as they understood that this was going to be much more clear, just like the rest of the zoning is clear. That, that was the general concern last time? It was just... Oh, yeah. Okay. That that's, that's that's it perfect. was people who had, had past determinations by various design oh, and review committees. And, yeah, so... Very it, consistent? It, very inconsistent. Yeah, very inconsistent, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So going for consistency here. Is Which is why we had emphasized so much in the previous draft very specific outcomes to go through and say, yes, you can replace your old windows with modern equivalents as long as you're meeting and matching blah, 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 blah. You know, it's got the right shape. It's got the right number of you know, um, panels. But you can upgrade to modern windows because what they had in the past was this person would come in and they'd be told you got to take out your 38 windows and send them off to a specialist to have them reconstructed and put back together again and put back in. And then the next guy comes in and they're like, no, you can take your windows out. <laughs> Replace them. And so they were like, well, this isn't fair. This, you know, My building's no different than their building. They're both historic buildings. Why did I have to spend all the extra money to save my historic windows? And a couple of the discussions were based on, on what we were talking about earlier that somebody was saying, well, I'm in the design review district, and so therefore I have to follow this. But my neighbor next door, who is also in the historic district, but beyond design review, does not have to follow these, you know, what's fair about that? Yeah. So that's where it started to make more sense for those two districts to actually match. But yeah, or to have some line, and that was really all my opinion has been on this, is that we have some justification for whatever the line is. It's just, you know, it follows neighborhood lines or it follows the historic district or it follows designated downtown. It's something that when somebody comes in to say, why am I in and my neighbor's not? Because you're in the designated downtown and they're not. And we could also and look at the zoning descriptions of the neighborhoods, too, to use that to some extent as a rationale. Because some of the neighborhoods are identified as being particularly historic. Historic, yeah. Wanting to maintain that. Um. How does how do the sizes compare with the uh, the National Register map, historic district? 
and the current. Well, this, well the current design review is quite big, right? So it's yeah. big in it, different yeah. places. I mean, this blue map is actually exactly what it is. It's yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about Barb's comments now about people who said that their neighbor wasn't was in the National Register, but not... It, like they were in the red, but not the blue. Uh, we had some up here and up in um, Cliff Street. Street. Yeah. So we had some people that were, were up here. So this guy was in, this guy was out. They're both. They're both in the blue. Or yeah. Actually, in this case, this would this had them. This had people that were in the blue. Yeah, they were saying I'm not even in the national register. Not even in the national register. But and some people in St. Paul. Yeah. Were in some were not. So, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, St. Paul was one because yours the line comes goes up. Right down the center of the goes street. down the center of the street. So it's I'm in, but the person across the street right. is not. Or, I think excuse me, the par person next door to me yeah. is not. Yeah. I think people have a good gripe when they say that I'm, I'm not even in the National Register area, but you're making me follow a store preservation. No, just design review. Just design well, if they're in, uh, as. As, with, as being proposed right now, if you're under design review, then you're under historic preservation design review. Same. Well, it's it's more than well, just historic preservation. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think that was what Mike was saying before. You could separate it into two sections, but I, I don't know if that gets more complicated. We can do design or we can do historic. And they chose to do design and historic, historic together. together. Right. Which... But not Which all doesn't the, make, you know, in certain cases, it makes it easier if they choose one or the other. But when they choose both, then you're kind of like, all right, well, we, it didn't really help us. But I still think the rules, these new rules are more heavily weighted towards historic than the old rules. So it makes less sense mm -hmm. to have national life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like it went the other direction where boy, it used to be really strict historic and now it went more design review. If it was going in that direction, then, you know, maybe, but it's... I mean, the reason that National Life was included in the first place... It's because it was in the Gateway District. Ah. It was that, there was a whole section on design review, and then they had these special sections for right. Riverfront and Western Gateway, which at the time was called Office Park, and so they were included because they were even though it still comes up, why does GMP have to go through design review? It's well, it is part of the well, gateway. We it is part of the gateway, but... As we come into the city. Yes. So, I suppose, yes. So, Barbara, are you inclined to be supportive of uh, a design review control district that's the same, more or less, as the uh, as the red, the, uh, as nat the National, National Historic Region? District? Cool. Um, Yes. So that would be a shrinking of what we're currently regulating. Well, but it's more properties, it's, it's less area. Yeah. And it's more properties close to the downtown, but that's also where we're more concerned about it than we are with National Life's Hillside. Um, so, or, or with the college, which is still not, you know, we're reviewing the, the college, but I you know, question comes up about how much we can actually have to say. Yeah, I mean, it's like the capital complex. You know, we don't really, we can't really make designations about the capital complex. No, that's why it's in white on this yeah. map. So it's in there, but it's really nothing. None it's, of our business. It's a donut. Yeah, we can't do anything. So, yeah. And there we can't do, We there's like 0% that we can do. I mean, there are percent <laughs> right, yes. Because they have their own yeah. regulations. Yeah, they have the capital complex commission who reviews for design. But I think we need a rationale if we're going to do that. You know, if we're going to say that it makes more sense for the um, design review district to follow the historic district, and here's why we think that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, based on our neighborhoods that are currently excluded or our, our streets that are split, you know, that kind of rationale. And, and you might notice when we when we put the neighborhoods on there that you know East State comes up like that, and then there's a separate yeah. neighborhood for the college. Yeah. So we may it's pretty it close. may be one that like I said we look at it's not in the National Register but there is a neighborhood up and around the college that is mixed use residential. Yeah. So.
Yeah, so I think it would help Oops. to see that. So, yeah, and like I said, we can always come up, we don't have to come up with one. I mean, we are going to go to the public. It would be nice if we came up with a couple of alternatives and said, here are the, you know, we broke it into four different options and you know, we looked at all four options. You know, a majority of the planning commission liked this option, but there were also members of the commission that liked this option. And now you at the public, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And they'll probably ask for something completely irrational, but much different. But as long as we can give them some criteria that we followed in order to make either one of those recommendations. And yeah, and what's the benefits of, of doing it? I think if Kim Cheney was here, what he would say is that the issue that came up last time was that there really wasn't a strong voice from Historic Preservation or HPC to advocate for design control and the value of protecting our historic structures. Um, the HPC had kind of dissolved and hadn't really been operating for a number of years and they kind of came back after this. Right. As, and to As a result of this, they, yeah. they reformed, they got new members and they started working on stuff. Um, so maybe this time when we go to the public, we'll have a group of people from HPC who might be able to go out and advocate for well, they, they punted the decision to us. They did punt on the boundary, but yeah. at least they would be there to talk about the value of what they put together and why mm -hmm. they felt this is, a, um, this is a better way to go and this is why it's improved and this is the value it adds to the community. And I do take their punt to mean that they're ready to defer to the decision <laughs> that we make. You know what I mean? Like if yep. if they felt strongly, then they but thought it, was they it will be it will be going to the public. And if they want to get this part passed, then they're going to need to have some. They'll have to take some comments on the map itself too, and they may punt at the public hearing on the map too and say we don't care, as long as whatever ends up being the boundary, we. We just want you to support the new rules for that area, and maybe they, you know, maybe they punt, maybe they don't. But I imagine if we had some sort of proposed change, they might have thoughts. Though. Even though they punted on it, that doesn't mean they wouldn't comment on what we. I think they would still comment on what we sent. We changed it. Yeah. Maybe not even with a unified voice. I think that they have different yeah. opinions. Yeah, I think if they had a unified voice, they yeah. probably would have. They just probably reached a, a reached a point of figuring out. We're not going to be able to, within our HPC, have a recommended option. So let's and let's let's move forward what we all right. agree on and leave this to the professionals. And probably they felt it was more in the purview of the planning commission than theirs theirs anyway. But so um, left it up to us. Yep. So because we were kind of dealing with some other business, two pieces of information uh, that are on mine. One is, I'm actually going to be on vacation at the next meeting, but I can get you guys all the maps. I think I've said everything. <laughs> Let you guys um, work on uh, work on the map part, um, if you guys are okay with that. Um, otherwise, we'd have to reschedule for a different week. The 26th. Yeah, I'll things. print them all up and make sure they're they're up here. I'll have Meredith drop them off, um, and maybe I'll see if she wants to attend. Just to kind of okay. Yeah, I think in light of that, maybe we can talk offline. But it's possible maybe we can have a shorter meeting and just just handle the boundary issue and leave the city plan. To, to connect back up with that and we have Mike again. September. So is it likely that we'll have public comment though at that next meeting? On the boundary? Yeah. I wouldn't think so. I, I would think we would want to decide on a couple of pieces. I mean obviously if anyone from the public shows up they're always welcome to speak. But I think at least according to our discussions and maybe you weren't here when we had the discussions a few meetings ago. Um, we were going to make a decision on the boundary. We were going to make some changes here, which Meredith and I have got to sit down and go over and go back to HPC. And then sometime later October, early November, we would put everything together and have a public input meeting. I'm, yeah, because there's not going to be an adoption of these rules quite yet because they need to have some 
um, design guidebooks made, and HPC is willing to do that. Before that's even adopted. But they can, well, yeah, it's kind of a chicken and egg. Yeah. You know, they really kind of need the guidebooks to go with the rules, but I shouldn't make the guidebook for the rules until I know they're actually something people support. So they're kind of in, let's move this forward, let's have some public hearings, let's go to city council, let's get some public input. If we know this is, people are comfortable with this, we can work on getting some more grants to do the guide. I, my impression was I didn't think they were going to go forward and adopt, although maybe they do, I don't know how you would enforce some of these rules, to kind of leave some stuff vague. Less vague but, than it is now. But. <laughs> yeah, less definitely less vague than it is now. So maybe they could just adopt them and then start to use them and then see where it goes. Um, there's no regulation that says they couldn't. Yeah, there's no regulation that says they could. But I think the idea I think was was that we would we would make a decision here and have some public input in late October, November, gauge the public, see what they think, and then kind of move forward from there. Um, but I won't be here on the 26th. The second thing I have before we run out of time is um, so municipal planning grants, you know, kind of the bread and butter of the grants that we usually get for working on stuff, those are due at the end of September, um, which is actually surprisingly right around the corner. Um, so there's usually a lot of interest in using this money for things the city council in last year's budget discussions they were going to have a discussion about doing a facilities and kind of basically doing an energy plan um, around the facilities pieces I'll have to get the rest of the details from them what specifically they wanted and they decided not to fund it through the general fund and they said but I think we'll just use the municipal planning grant to do that so I just wanted to go and say that's what I was going to move forward with writing the municipal planning grant on you guys will have to approve that at some point if there's a push to do something else or find a different topic um, but usually the municipal planning grants for updating zoning updating plans would have been great to do the guidebook but Group. They'll have to do CLG grant for the guidebook, um, but we'll do um, this energy planning unless you know, unless something else comes up, and if it does, we'll talk about it. But I just always need a window of time so I can write the grant so I can get the stuff approved. So I just want to give you guys a heads up that that is coming up, um, but that I'm going to expect that we're doing the energy plan. Seems worthwhile. Well, okay. just reminded me though that so CVRPC just received a grant for our housing mitigation plan update. Is that something that how does this group relate to that process? Historically, I haven't seen it come through here, but that's um, I'm the state reviewer for the plans. So I'm just yes, yeah, we we advised <laughs> them that ours was going to be <laughs> expiring. I think next March or April. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, early it's next it's year. Perfect. Early next year was supposed to expire, so it was on our to-do for this fiscal year work plan. Okay. Um, but usually they're working more directly with Bob Gowans. And, uh, yeah, I, appreciate, I always appreciate when they do those for us because uh, that's what we do. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm happy to help. So. Oh, you know what we forgot to put on there? Well, remind me to put on, on the, the RPC appointment. Yeah. Um, okay. Just so we put that on the agenda for next time. All right. So do we have a do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Our time is up. So moved by Barb. Second. Seconded by Aaron. Okay. Aye. Aye. <laughs> and we are adjourned.